coming in. We're testing out new technology, so if it's too loud or too quiet, go ahead and let me know. Um, I'll try not to clear my throat too loud into this mic, but I'm having a little bit of a dry throat situation. Um, additionally, for questions, we are going to pass the mic for questions. So if you have a question, just let me know. Raise your hand, signal, and I will come to you with the mic so everyone can hear. We're practicing our new technology. All right. So, and I'm happy to take questions um, throughout the presentation. So, and I'll let you know if it's something I'm going to get to later, or um, I'll be happy to answer it as we go. So, Section 388 Petitions. We're going to discuss a lot of information in this short hour. Um, there's so many cases on Section 388. Um, published and then like every day it seems like an unpublished case is coming out as well so just note that this is not all inclusive it's not exhaustive there is a lot that is not included in this presentation in terms of when we get to change circumstances or examples of that so with that being said oh this turn hold on technology okay um, so who can file a 388 petition? Some of this is going to be basic. I'll go through it pretty quickly. It's any parent or other person who has an interest in the child. And it's really based on two, two a showing of two things, either changed circumstances or new evidence, as we'll get to, and best interest of the child. So you guys should all know that. What can I file a 388 petition for? Um, quite a number of things, you'll see. Um, I kind of tried to uh, frame this in the sword in terms of our um, offensive way of filing 388s versus the shield and that we're protected by due process um, for certain orders to be uh, changed by a 388. So the sword, these are for your client. What can you do? Request liberalized visitation, change a court order case plan or paternity status, reinstate FR or seek home of parent after either the, well, prior to the 2-6 and after either the denial or termination of FR, seek placement with a non-custodial parent post-dispo, invalidate the proceedings either for lack of notice, um, Ansley as we'll get into, or for new evidence that gives um, rise to a question of the validity of the proceedings, terminate a legal guardianship through dependency, uh, a dependency legal guardianship, um, this is a non-exhaustive list as far as liberalized visitation goes. Um, I put some information in here in terms of a practice tip. Um, don't be afraid to file these 3 dates in between review hearings to try and move your client along in terms of the reunification process. But it's always a better, better idea to go um, and try and resolve it informally with the social worker or through the county council and other attorneys because if you can get them to agree to exercise their discretion, you're submitting documents or proof of what your client's doing, great, that's going to be all the better. If they are withholding their discretion though in a way that you think is unreasonable, do not be afraid to file that 388 timely three, four months into the review process. At least get that information before the court. Worst case, um, worst case, you're going to have that information presented through um, a, a filed motion and the department will have no excuse for saying they didn't receive it. Um, and best case, you're going to have an opportunity to try and liberalize your client's visits that might set them up for a better argument for return at a 2 and e 2 and f 2 2 Because we know it's not the law, but how many times has a judge said, well, your client only has monitored visits. How in the world can I return from monitored visits to return? Well, that's not the law, but a lot of times you can help it along the way by getting that liberalized visit visitation in the interim. Um, oops, <coughs> went backwards. So when are they filed alternatively by other counsels? So the shield of due process. Um, 3D petitions are required by other counsel to either uh, request a parent's visitation be in a more restrictive setting. Now, just FYI, the case that this came from, Lance B, was in fact a restriction of mothers two times a week monitored visitation to one time a week monitored visitation. This is not necessarily required only for a restriction from unmonitored to monitored. It is a restriction of whatever the court order visitation is, either in 
um, terms of its um, monitored or unmonitored status, or in terms of its frequency, location. I mean, if they're trying to restrict it all of a sudden to a DCFS office when the court ordered a neutral location or a public setting or something to that effect, these should require a um, 3D pursuant to in Lance B, and that's because you have a due process right to address the reasons why this is happening. Um, and if you find out that sometimes, I don't know, has anybody had the situation where your client says, they call you and say, the social worker all of a sudden told me that my visits are monitored uh, when they were having unmonitored visits. Nothing's been filed in court, but all, the social worker kind of on their own arbitrarily exercised their discretion to restrict visits. Anybody had that situation happen? Yes, I see some heads nodding. Um, you know, that, that is absolutely a problem, and I would consider first maybe reaching out to the county council, letting them know, like, hey, think that this is improper. I'm asking you to speak with your client and kind of uh, fix this issue informally. Or you can try a walk-on request, so just uh, walking it onto the court and indicating that this is an improper, illegal um, uh, use of their discretion to restrict visits, and just be prepared that that might then trigger a formal 3D or motion process in which they will seek to formally, through the court process, restrict your client's visits. Additionally, they're used to terminate reunification services before the time frames have um, uh, gone up to request removal of a child from their current placement, including removal from a parent. So now, this is not necessarily an alternative to a 387 or 342 from the department, but remember, as I said, 388 is for any person um, any parent or person having an interest in the child or the child themselves. So the child can, uh, minors counsel can request by way of a 388 removal from a parent. Um, another parent could ask for removal from another parent. Not advisable, but it's not restricted in any way um, to um, any particular set of persons. So, but if the department tries to do that, then you want to really hold them to their requirements under 387 and 342, where it specifically says if the petitioning agency wants to X, Y, Z, if they believe this, you know, the disposition has been ineffective, they file a 387 petition. Um, to also uh, request a change in placement, so maybe to request a change with a relative post disposition, um, to like remove from a relative post disposition, or even sometimes to change the placement to place with a relative who didn't come forward early on in the case. Um, that can be a mechanism. Um, or to request reinstatement of parental rights. Pretty rare thing that happens. Um, just be aware of it. 3 dates not required for ed rights limitation. That's just normal. Um, uh, it would be normal notice and it can be addressed um, at any time at any hearing. Um, or um, at the statutory provided hearings. So that's why we see those by walk-on requests quite a bit. When can I file a 388? So when do you use this option? It's really only filed after disposition following a declaration of dependency or entry of a 360A guardianship. And that's kind of by definition within the statute 388. It says for any child who's been declared a dependent or after the um, um, entry of a 360A guardianship. So that's the timing we're looking at here. Um, prior to disposition, you guys should utilize the fact that prior to disposition, the burdens of proof are very, very high in our favor in terms of clear and convincing for removal. So you have your, you have your remedies and your opportunities to put forth your arguments at that point. Um, and really anything before disposition is not appealable. So I think that's another reason why this doesn't come up until after disposition. So it's really any time a requested order requires a change and you're without the protection of a statutory hearing. So you don't have those burdens of proof in your favor, um, you're not added to 1E or you're past TFR or FR has been denied and you want to get a change for your client. Um, I just put some language in here from Victoria C and Section 3 and 8 that you can seek any conceivable change or modification of it, an existing order. So it's really broad. I mean, we can be creative with these, just so long as you're still putting, making sure that you're meeting the criteria for change circumstances or new evidence and best interest of the child. And I did, this is uh, 
the case where it allowed a non-custodial parent to seek removal of the child from the custodial parent. So, yikes, but it's something that can happen in some of um, these cases. So we're back to the sword. Our probably most common use of a 388, um, or the one that you get told about the most in training, is this prior to a 2-6 hearing, post TFR or denial of FR. So it's um, really laid out first in, in Ray Marilyn H, where they get this great language about it being the last chance escape mechanism for a parent. Um, to avoid uh, the termination of their parental rights. The problem being that when you're filing these 388s post TFR or denial of FR, the best interest standard becomes extra hard for us to meet because you're dealing with a shift in the court's focus. They're no longer looking at reunification um, with the family. They're looking at permanency and stability for this child. So just remember that also for these um, 388s that you're filing maybe prior, so during the reunification period. If you're filing one for liberalization of visits during the reunification period, part of your best interest argument might be, given that the court ordered reunification, the focus for this family is on reunification, that that's part of the best interest argument as to why they should be going forward in liberalization of visits. But remember, this is my pitch for ICWA, because you all know I'm an ICWA person, but <laughs> with a limited reversal of TPR and the remand for ICWA notice, you cannot file a Section 388 petition. They're, once they've done that limited reversal for ICWA notice, the only purpose that we are appearing in that matter and the only purpose for the case being um, still open with parental rights intact is to make sure that those ICWA notices are complete and accurate and sent out and um, the Indian ancestry is fully um, explored or verified. If that's all done, TPR goes right back into effect. If it's not, then you might have more of a say, in, you, would, you would definitely have more of a say in these proceedings if the child turns out to be an Indian child. But in my experience, I think I've only seen that happen one time, um, that it actually, a limited reversal and remand resulted in it actually being a uh, codified Indian child. So this is my pitch for making sure that ICWA notice is great up front because as we've said, it's really annoying when your client then thinks on this limited reversal, they reverse my termination of parental rights. Now I want my visits back and I want my kid in my custody and you can't do any of that. You're like, no, sorry, we're just gonna, is your name spelled right on these notices? What's your mom's name? <laughs> You're just checking that at this point. So. A side note to this also is that really the timing of a 388, there is no timeliness requirement for the filing of a 388. It's any time prior to the 2-6 hearing. Nowhere in the statute or in case law could I find any requirement that it be filed X number of days or um, X number of hours even. So can you file that day of 388 on the day of the 2-6? Absolutely. Um, and I would go straight to Marilyn H. and the cases that talk about it afterwards is that any time prior to the termination of parental rights, this is our one and only last chance remedy. And that is what the case law makes very clear, that as long as parental rights have not been severed, we still have the opportunity to do so. So somebody had been talking to me about this and said, okay, so you file that day of 388. Can the court make you go forward on it? that day? <coughs> sure, why not? Um, you might be able to argue if the court is finding that there's a prima facie basis to grant you an evidentiary hearing. You might be able to argue due process concerns and get a continuance if witnesses need to testify. We'll get into due process later, but the court does not have to hear testimony. Sure, the court could go forward that day. So if you're trying to file a meritorious one that day, you better make sure it's as detailed as possible and attach as much information as you can. Hopefully you're not filing a meritorious 388 the day of the 2-6, though. For the most part, those should be developed at least, you know, a week or two, hopefully, before the 388, if not more. So how do you file it? Form JV-180, everyone should know that it's, um, 
uh, California Rules of Court 5.570 also direct you to what specifically should be included in it. Most of that information is on the JV 180 form. It's been incorporated into that. It does have to contain an original signature, so it needs to be verified. And I know that firms have different policies about whether that's signed by your client or signed by you, so talk with your supervisor or firm director about um, that. Um, you want to make sure your client's address and contact information is up to date. And most importantly, this should contain attachments to support your assertions made within. And I'll explain exactly why when we get to about a slide or two forward. Um, you don't want to just use those four lines on that, on that sheet to try and encompass everything that your client has been doing to change their circumstances. If this is really a meritorious one, maybe that's your CYA 388 that you just write in the four lines, mom did parenting and she thinks she's all ready to have a kid back now. <laughs> um, but if you're really filing one that you want to get granted, do not limit yourself to those four lines and we'll get into um, what I think you will be required to show with, um, based on case law. Um, I did provide you guys with a handout that is kind of just like a sample um, attachment of what you could say that's more detailed. Um, you can either do it like this in a Word document attachment for item 7 and attach it to the 388 petition, or you can use the, ju um, sorry, not the juvenile court form, the, um, um, the, it's judicial counsel form, there it is. The judicial counsel form MC025, it's a blank attachment form that can be used for any, um, any judicial counsel form attachment. This is a good example of the detail that you might want to include in your 388 to support the change in circumstances and the best <coughs> interest. And note that at the bottom it says see attached documentation in support of the above information. You don't want to just make these conclusory statements and not support it by anything, because that's not going to be sufficient to get you a hearing necessarily on the petition. What happens after you file it? Um, the court is supposed to liberally construe it in favor of its sufficiency to get you a hearing um, based on prima facie. So finally we get to benefit from that detention standard prima facie. Sure doesn't feel like it though sometimes when we file these 388s, I'll say. Um, but you really are only supposed to have to show prima facie, change circumstances or new evidence, and the request of changes in the best interest. Court has four options. Granted, if everyone agrees, has anyone ever seen that happen? <laughs> Deny it ex parte. Um, or there's the more commonly we have the either grant it for everybody to argue about whether it made a prima facie showing, um, or grant it for an evidentiary hearing um, uh, based on the fact that it's made a prima facie showing. So what is a prima facie showing? This is where I really think that in my review of uh, countless cases on 388, it's really important that if you have a meritorious 388 that we are supporting it with attached evidence, declarations, those sorts of things. Um, I'm not going to read all these statements for you here, but I will let you know that in Ray Anthony W., one of the cases cited here in um, the second bullet point um, for the mere conclusory statements, I'll tell you what that actually was said in that case. So the court said mother merely asserted that she had, quote, participated in and completed the family reunification program. Um, and quote, including drug counseling, testing, parenting classes, that she visits the children regularly, and that she had given birth to a, quote, new child which is not a dependent of the court. So, how many of you have filed a 388 with something to that effect on your changed circumstances? That seems, maybe on its face, you're like, wait, that seems like those are the facts that we would be looking for. Well, the problem here is the court said these statements are conclusory. No mention was made of dates, names, um, dates or names of counselors, so specifics about when this program was completed, who they were seeing, you know, this person was the case manager, or this person was the counselor. Um, the assertions were unsupported by any attachments, such as certificates or drug test results, so that was very important in there. And finally, and this is something that you might have to contend with, 
very often when we're filing a 388 um, post TFR or after the denial of FR, they said that mother's assertion that she visits the children on a regular basis is nothing more than assertions entirely unsubstantiated by even a declaration. And what they went to was that the record shows from the social worker reports that were previously submitted that mother was not visiting the children between the times suggested when she filed her 388. And she did not present anything to suggest otherwise. So think about that. If you are actually putting in information that is contrary to what's, I mean, if it's in the social worker reports that your client's visiting um, uh, regularly and consistently and you're writing that in the best interest, you can also say see report or whatever it may be. But if it's, if the reports are saying your client's not, and you're filing this 388 to say that they are, you're going to need a declaration from your client to support that, to give credibility to that, um, to help get you that prima facie showing to get you an evidentiary hearing. So now, are some of your judges granting them without those attachments? Sure, they may be. But if you want to set the, if you want to put one that is more bulletproof for an appeal, in case you are getting one denied, these are the kinds of things that you're going to need. Any questions about that? Nobody wants to ask questions because there's a mic involved. That's the problem. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, in Ray Liam L, this is an interesting <coughs> case, and I just kind of wanted to highlight it for you guys because I think it brings up a couple of different issues here. This is the case that stands for um, a 388 used to seek placement with a previously non custodial parent. The reason I wanted to highlight this is because this is why it might benefit you if you have a non-custodial parent who is like not really going seeking, um, not in a place to have custody at the time of the disposition, that you probably shouldn't make that argument under 361.2. You can just say, my client's not seeking custody. That should not trigger a detriment finding. The case law says that a 361.2 detriment finding should only be made if the non-custodial parent is seeking custody. Now, can the court make orders about your client's visitation or um, otherwise under 361A? Yes, they can, but it won't be a detriment finding. And thus, you have this case of in re Leonel, which might put you in a really strong position for your previously non-custodial parent moving forward in the case. If there's something that they needed to do to really put themselves in that stable position where they wanted custody of their child. Um, so in this case, you know, there was an issue. Dad really didn't have a relationship with the child. So mom was getting the kids removed. Dad really didn't have a relationship. He wanted to work on that relationship. Uh, he wanted custody, but decided that he wanted to work on the relationship first and did not seek custody at disposition. The court didn't then order any FR, didn't, <coughs> excuse me, make a detriment finding. And he was given supervised visitation with discretion to liberalize. Um, and the court had, in fact, ordered an ICPC just to get some more information about him. What the case really stands for is that a non-custodial parent, then he subsequently filed a 388, and the court found that a non-custodial parent makes a prima facie case of best interest just by simply requesting custody. <coughs> of their child then post dispo. So you've it's it's a really sort of <clears throat> sorry, clear cut case of um, best interest that you can use when you have a non custodial parent who maybe wants to work on their relationship with their child or maybe needs some time to get more stable housing in place um, before they request custody or maybe want to give mom or the custodial parent a chance to see if they're gonna turn things around and get the kid back themselves. Just note that this assumes no prior detriment findings. So this really does um, require the court to have never made a detriment finding. Timing. This is very important too. So I told you that you could file 388s during FR between review periods to try and liberalize visitation if it was appropriate in the case, right? And you guys are probably all like, but how is that possibly going to happen? Because if we file 388 at three months, the court's going to say, well, I'll just set it for the 21E, and then why would you want to do that? Because you have a higher, the burden's on the department of the 21E versus the burden on you at a 388. Well, 
The rules of court say that if a hearing is set, it must take place within 30 calendar days after the filing of the petition. You are entitled to a hearing within 30 days of the filing of your petition. Like a no time waiver trial, you better speak up or you'll waive this, this um, timing. But if you do have that case where you're trying to keep it on a quick timeline, you file it at three months between the review hearings, you should be able to get a hearing by four months, which still gives two months potentially for that, if you're successful, liberalized visitation to take place, setting you up for a possible return argument. Now, are there times where we might waive this? Certainly, I would recommend that you don't let your 380 petition linger and die or languish in the ether of uh, continuances um, upon continuances, but Sometimes you file it right before that 2-6. It's kind of like a little iffy. It's a little maybe premature. Your client's like kind of doing their stuff, but not, not the strongest of 3-8s. And then the 2-6 gets continued. Well, maybe you're okay with your 3-8 getting continued. Um, there's a couple of things you should consider there, though. Um, you might want to consider perhaps withdrawing that 388 um, and refiling one without prejudice that is more substantive and actually addresses the issues in a better way since the court is technically looking on the, on the face of your petition. So anything else that happens after is not going to be considered um, uh, necessarily for a part of the um, motion because they don't have to let you present any additional documentary um, evidence if they don't want to, but we'll get into that. Um, so you might want to consider withdrawing it. Um, you might want to consider, maybe if it's good enough, even if the 2-6 gets continued, you might want to consider going forward to liberalize visits, because again, that can be helpful in your 2-6-C-1-B-1 arguments as well. If you have a client with monitored visits, if you could get them liberalized to unmonitored, you might have a stronger case for the parent-child bond exception for 2-6. Notice then, thereafter is supposed to be given by the court as soon as possible after the filing of the petition, but no less than five days before the hearing is to take place. So if you're on the opposite side of a 388 being filed, you are entitled to notice at least five days before the hearing is supposed to take place. So it's not very much notice, but be aware that that is the time frame if you needed to ask for a continuance of the 26, I mean of the 388. I see a question. Awesome. I love this thing. Um, so, what do you recommend we do? Gosh, this is so weird. <laughs> what do you recommend we do if, for preserving your record in terms of the timing of the hearing, if the court's refusing to go on the record when they're setting the dates and they set the date like several months in advance? How do we preserve that issue? Um, well. That's, so the court is absolutely refusing. You can't get them to go on the record no matter what. You might need to file a motion. Okay. You might need to file a motion with the court. Um, I, I have one in our motion bank that's sort of similar, essentially uh, laying out the law and requesting your statutorily um, uh, and guaranteed hearing within the time frames prescribed. Um, I don't know if that's going to be successful. It's going to probably depend on how far um, uh, outside this 30 days the court has gone. And honestly, they may not calendar your motion. But if they're refusing to go on the record to even do that for you, then I think the only remedy you would have at that time is to file a motion. Or if your court was maybe try a walk-on request, but if the court was refusing to go on the record for setting of the 388, if you feel like they're going to refuse to go on the record discretionarily for a walk-on request. So, I mean, that's a tough situation, but I certainly would try, um, I, I don't know what courtrooms are so... Are I'm thinking 415. Okay. Refusing to go on the record at all. Yeah, I would think. Okay. Um, y you know, I would continue to try and make your, make your pitch off the record to bench officers if that's a problem and let them know. And, and if you need to, I guess you take your remedies. I know the Court of Appeal hasn't been super awesome on our uh, writs for failure to adhere to timelines. So it's really sort of a totality of the circumstances situation. I mean, are they putting your 388 out 
120 days for a 2-6 continuance, that's pretty egregious. Are they putting your 3B out for a 45-day or 60-day hearing? Might not be worth the fight necessarily. Burdens of proof. Um, so the person filing the 3D has the burden of proof, we all understand. I think we've always just kind of thought of it as change circumstances and best interest. Preponderance of the evidence, that's what we have to show. Well, just so you're aware, there are some specific um, burdens of proof delineated in a, in a variety of situations. So it's generally speaking, preponderance of the evidence. For most of our requests, it will be preponderance of the evidence. With the exception of a request to modify any orders related to the custody or visitation of the child for whom reunification services were not ordered, pursuant to 4, 5, and 6. If your client was denied FR under 361.5 before 5 or 6, you are going to be held to the higher burden of clear and convincing evidence of best interests. Um, also, likewise, for anybody who's filing it to try and um, subsequently modify the order um, that services were not needed pursuant to that section. Um, additionally, it's clear and convincing evidence of grounds in WIC 361C for the removal of children from their homes, so it takes you right back to a disposition standard. So it's not an end run around the 387 or 342. It's still, you're still protected by the standards um, under a dispositional hearing for a removal um, after um, the initial disposition. Also, clear and convincing evidence of conditions in 388 C1A or B to terminate FR early. So what that sh those sections say is that it would appear that a change of circumstance or new evidence exists that justifies the termination of FR and those circumstances might be the action or inaction of the parent or guardian that creates a substantial likelihood that reunification will not occur. So maybe your client not doing <coughs> jack in their case plan. Um, or the parent or guardian's failure to visit the child. So this is not as strict as the uh, complete failure to contact the child. Um, uh, you might be able to show it under this section. Or the failure of the parent or guardian to participate regularly and make substantive progress in the court or treatment program. So plain and simple there. Otherwise, it's going to be preponderance of the evidence. And the only caveat is that you must conduct it as a dispositional hearing if the request is to TFR or there is some kind of due process right to confront and cross-examine witnesses, such as the removal um, to a more restrictive placement. Due process. So I mentioned to you earlier that we would talk about due process. Generally speaking, the rule says proof may be made by declaration and other documentary <coughs> evidence or by testimony or both at the discretion of the court. That's where we get tripped up um, because the court can and sometimes if they really don't like your client will exercise their discretion to say I don't want to hear anything, I'm going to decide just based on what's in front of me, which may be just your 388 petition with its attachments and the social worker's report, um, or it may be if you filed it that day of just your 388 petition with its attachments, hence the reason why you want to include attachments that might be declarations or additional um, uh, self-authenticating documents. Um, maybe an updated letter from a therapist where there's already been the therapist's signature and information in the, in the reports, things like that. However, what case law says is that rule is at, not absolute and it does not override a parent's right to due process or anybody's right for that matter. Um, in Ray Clifton B, in that case, the court was um, looking at what was a clear credibility contest between mom and the paternal grandmother. So this was a, a 388 post, um, I believe it was post TFR to try and uh, get return or, or more FR and paternal grandmother was the caregiver. Um, so there was a clear credibility dispute in that, um, and the court in that case, the trial court, resolved it against the mother. 
um, based solely on written submissions and argument of counsel. So based on the social worker's report that gave grandma's statements and arguments of counsel, the court resolved the credibility determination against the mother. That's improper. Now, that's improper only if you are requesting to present evidence by way of testimony and the court is denying you. The court absolutely can resolve credibility disputes based on the documents in front of them if you have not made a request to present testimonial evidence. So if there is a credibility dispute, you need to consider subpoenaing or requesting um, witnesses to be present if it's the social worker or the caregiver to be cited in, or if it's somebody who is one of your witnesses, you need to make those considerations because otherwise the court can and will resolve credibility disputes based on what's in front of them. It becomes much more difficult if you um, put those witnesses up. Obviously the court can just make a credibility determination about a witness who testified in front of them, um, but they have to do so within, within reason. So, um, in, in that Clifton B case, the court said that they should have received mother's oral testimony and should have permitted her to cross-examine the grandmother and the social worker who prepared the report. So those are things that you are entitled to. In Ray Matthew P is another case that just kind of says that, um, I said must give the parent the opportunity. Technically, Matthew P was a de facto parent's case, but same difference in terms of what it stands for. Um, you do have that right to, at the very least, cross-examine the social worker if they've pr presented this 388 report and contradicted a bunch of stuff that you put in your 388 petition. You can cross-examine the social worker. Any questions about due process? No. So now just the super nitty-gritty of changed versus changing circumstances. We've all probably heard that distinction. It must be change, not changing. Well, where do you draw the line? It's kind of a difficult thing to say. You know, some, some um, you know, therapy may be a lifelong ongoing process, so you're always continually changing. But really the court wants to look at um, whether, we'll see, whether the change is substantial and really like permanent or lasting. So not every change is going to justify a modification. In that NRA SR case, um, the court found that because the department was trying to vacate an order for a bonding study because they couldn't find a Spanish bonding study um, uh, provider. Um, so, and the court's like, okay, sure, let's just vacate that. Like, I guess if you can't do it, we won't do it. Um, the appellate court said no. The court is without discretion to modify or vacate an order without substantial evidence on the record in this case that the bonding study was no longer necessary or appropriate for legitimate reasons other than the apparent difficulty by the department in complying with the order. So, you know, maybe there's no Spanish-speaking bonding uh, study expert, but did they try to obtain an interpreter who could have been present during the um, the evaluation. How far did they look in terms of did they need to look out of county for an expert? The reason I go into a little bit more detail about this is because I think this also will apply to any request. I don't know if you've ever had clients who are like, can we just get that uh, something off my uh, case plan? I don't, can we get the testing off my case plan? Or I don't think I need that um, psychological assessment anymore. It's going to apply to you the same thing to try and modify a client's case plan. You're going to have to show that it's no longer necessary or appropriate. So you're going to have to kind of show that the client somehow, through alternative means, maybe uh, addressed that issue if you're trying to modify a case plan. Um, what I will say is SR specifically said, for example, um, changes in parental circumstances that make reunification desirable may justify modification of an order terminating services. That's where we get our basis for filing these 388s um, for after TFR. So think about what circumstances make reunification desirable for your client. Here's the language I said. I've sort of gleaned this from the numerous cases that I've read. A lot of them say specifically, quote, substantial. Um, may not say specifically within it permanent, but the theme and overarching concerns in these cases 
are that this change actually be something that we can count on lasting long into the future. So maybe not permanent, but at least long lasting. Um, but that's what I've kind of gleaned from all these cases. There's a couple of examples for you here. Um, you know, it's this one is particularly, I think, important, and they kind of talk about how when your client has a long drug history, you're going to have a much more difficult time asserting change circumstances within the period between a TFR and a, and a 2.6 because that's four months in comparison to how long have they been using drugs? How long has their sobriety been a struggle for them? Even if they've been 100% sober on it in that period of time, you are going to have an uphill fight. Um, so really you need to take into consideration what is your client's underlying problem? How long has this been lasting for? And, and weighing and balancing the, the change that's occurred. It doesn't mean you don't file a 3D. I'm just telling you that you might have a tough time with a client with a long-standing drug history. I will say the case law is really bad for substance abuse and successful 388s. Um, some more examples. If it's based on new evidence, I just wanted to give you the um, highlight that there's three requirements. It must actually be new evidence, um, and it must have been unavailable earlier despite reasonable diligence, and it must be material to the issues. So don't go filing these three needs to try and um, undo adjudication all over the place. That's not going to um, be likely to happen. Um, I will say the NRA HS case where they talked about they tried to file a 3D based on new expert, a new expert report and opinion based on old records and medical and the, they just got an expert later to review everything. They should have done that before adjudication. They should have done that before the petition was, was sustained. So the court said, mm, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not quite, you could have done that with reasonable diligence in advance of the hearing. So make sure it's actually new evidence. Um, so just some things to consider. Has your client completed their programs? Um, you know, is it a, were they recently released from incarceration? Are they all of a sudden employed? Um, have they obtained stable housing? Um, have they given birth to a new child that's not been removed? And if so, has that child met their sibling? Um, and establish any kind of relationship. Has the mental health diagnosis changed? Have the child circumstances changed? So that's not up there, but that's also something to consider. Has something changed with the child that might necessitate this um, being uh, put in place? Maybe the child's placement changed now. They're no longer in a permanent placement. Or maybe the child's position um, in terms of wanting to return to mom or dad has changed. Best interest, so this is where it gets tough for us, particularly in these 388s we're filing after the termination of FR or denial of FR. Because at that point, the court is weighing the child's interest in permanency and stability against our client's uh, attempts to regain custody or get more FR. And what I will say is that In Ray Kimberly F gives you some of the factors, specifically factor two involves the strength of the bonds between both the caregiver and the child and the parent and the child and the comparison of those relationships. So while bond with a caregiver is not relevant during FR, it becomes highly relevant at this stage of the proceedings when you're filing a 3D post TFR or post denial of FR. So um, you're going to be stuck with that. The Kimberly F factors are not exhaustive. I gave you the example of Jacob P, which says sibling bonds might be something you can raise. Are, are kids placed in different homes? Maybe your client can help maintain those sibling bonds better by having them all together. Um, child's wishes, while not determinative, they are relevant, um, you know, taking into consideration the child's age. These are some things to consider kind of went over some of them already. Um, I would say it's important that you're advising your client um, when reunification, or before, but when reunification <coughs> services are terminated, that in order to set them up for a successful 388, try and make sure that they are 
participating in the child's school, schooling or um, medical needs. In the example um, attachment form I gave you, I talk about on the back for attachment for item 9 in this case, this, this father has been practicing, his, he's been practicing what he learned through his parenting program um, with a system of rewards in relation to his daughter and her schoolwork, and he's seen an improvement as a result. That's, that's pretty important, and I would obviously support that by a declaration, but those kind of things can really help you to achieve best interests. Caution, they can't consider the bond. This is the case that explains to you why and how after termination of reunification at the late stage of the proceedings that the court can, in fact, weigh and balance those bonds. So, moving on to, for the last 15 minutes, I'm really going to discuss Ansel. So, utilizing a 3D to invalidate the proceedings. It can be used under limited circumstances when um, I need you to be thinking about any time you're appointed to represent a parent who's shown up for their first time after the jurisdictional hearing in the 300 petition. Red flags, sirens, oh my gosh, why are they showing up so late in the proceedings? Did they not get noticed? That's what you should be thinking about. Um, and it's important that at that point, you are making a special appearance and making no requests, except for maybe a continuance to review the notices, because that's consistent with your special appearance. Um, for any nerds out there, or if people just want to actually know what the difference between a general and a special appearance is, I gave you black law... Black's Law Dictionary um, definition of it, and it's important that special appearance really is just submitting to the jurisdiction of the court for a specific purpose. That's why we have to limit our appearance if we're submitting to the jurisdiction of the court just for the purposes of checking notice. Make that clear. So you can say the words special appearance, but if you say things that would consist of a general appearance, whether you said special appearance or not, that's going to be a general appearance. So when you make your special appearance, it's not just using the word special appearance. It's saying that I'm making a special appearance for the limited purposes of reviewing notice and a possible filing of an ANSI motion. And that's really all you can do. So it sucks because what if your client wants visits? I recommend you try and uh, urge minors counsel to make some requests for your client if uh, you can. Um, these are just some more cases that talk about the problems with um, making a special appearance but actually saying things outside of that and it being constructed as a general appearance. Um, and in Ray BG is a very good example of a cautionary tale where unfortunately they said that she appeared at the status review hearing, made these requests for custody, and thus waived any of her issues with defect in notice or the underlying jurisdictional and dispositional issues, which may have been void for lack of the court's jurisdiction. So, Ansley. Um, I know that everybody relies on Ansley as like our be-all, end-all case for these 388s to challenge the dependency judgment based on a lack of notice or due process. Um, what I want you to know is that I've seen this just put on the four lines of the JV 180, under why is it in the child's best interest, I've seen people quote the language of Ansley and just say, it's implicit in the juvenile dependency statutes that it's always in the best interest of the minor, blah, 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 blah. That is not going to be sufficient, okay? <laughs> so we may have relied on that for a period of time, um, and we may have continued to rely on it even after the um, case of Justice P came out in 2004. But county council has gotten wiser to it, and they are citing this to the courts. And it is very relevant and on point um, <clears throat> case law. I urge you all to read Justice P. It's not that long, um, and it's a good case um, for us to be aware of, especially given its prominence of, in court as it's being cited by county council. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a <clears throat> rundown. So in this case, Father appealed the denial of a hearing on his 388. He was trying to um, uh, void um, the proceedings and go back to jurisdiction because he said they didn't make reasonable efforts to search and find him. Um, what the court says here is that 
it does not automatically follow that the best interest of the child would be promoted by going back to square one when the department does not uh, adequately notice the parents. So there is no automatic best <coughs> interest um, for <coughs> failure to notice, like there was in maybe in Ray Liam P for a non-custodial parent who requests custody. This case distinguished Ansley particularly in a couple of different ways. They said that in the Ansley case, there was absolutely no effort to notice that father. Absolutely none. In this case, they actually did make some efforts. They kind of tried to find him. They just weren't like super good at it, obviously, because um, they didn't find him. Additionally, in Ansley, the father challenged the jurisdiction, whereas in this case, in Justice P, he was only challenging disposition. This is an important distinction, you guys. Because what ANSI stands for is that a failure to properly give notice makes the court devoid of its jurisdiction, underlying jurisdiction to hear the case. If you are filing an ANSI motion and only challenging disposition, you're kind of, you're submitting to the jurisdiction of the court by almost very nature of that request. So best practice, even if your client is not offending, you might want to indicate in your, in your 388 that you're challenging the um, court's underlying jurisdiction and maybe subsequent dispositional orders in the case. Also, they said that harmless error. Even though there was a delay in noticing the father, there was no prejudice in this case. So, basically what they were saying is, Ansley's old, we don't think it carries the day, you need to give us more in your best interest to convince us that your client should have a chance at going back to square one. In this case, they said that he um, said he was going to be a substantial fixture in their life, that um, he would keep the children together and maintain the sibling relationship, which all those things might be good to put in the case if you could actually support it with your client's um, declaration or the information before the court. But this father hadn't seen the child in almost a year before the proceedings. He had a really up and down criminal lifestyle history, in and out of jail. Um, and um, his incarceration precluded his full commitment to his parental responsibilities. So note that you can still distinguish. You could say that it is in the child's best interest if your client is has a relationship with the kids, is stable and um, appropriate as a placement for the kids, but support that with some attachments. Uh, you might want to support that with um, a lease or rental agreement if you're trying to establish their stability. You might want to support, well, you probably should support with a declaration um, and uh, Maybe if you had proof of it, maybe text messages or phone records to show that they were, if there's a dispute between um, parties about their attempts to contact or contact with the kids. Um, preparing an Ansley motion. So, pretty straightforward, make your special appearance, ask for the continuance, review the file, and then determine whether notice is proper or not. i give you some information here about, make sure that you're checking it, Review the statute. Just because the court said it's proper doesn't mean it's proper. If notice was not proper, then you want to prepare that 388 petition. So you are going to need to explain the defect in notice and reference attached exhibits. Now I want to tell you that that unpublished case I gave you is from our district. It applies Justice P to a 388 hearing in our district. Justice P was a fourth district case, this unpublished case applies it in the second district, our district. It has some very um, interesting language in it that's not necessarily so helpful for us in terms of uh, filing these successful 388s, but it lets you know what you're going to be up against. It cites to NRA Emily R, um, 80 Cal App 4th 1344, which says that the petitioning parent has the burden of showing that the social services agency's search efforts would have been successful in locating the parent. So you have to show that your client was actually there at the place that they should have and could have located him at the time of the adjudication. So you're going to need a declaration from your client or a document proving that, maybe a rent payment or, or a utility bill or something to that effect. You have to prove it. In that case, 
um, they were saying in the unpublished case, they were trying to say that he was in federal custody, that a person matching his name and description was in the federal um, custody locator at the time of the adjudication. They said, well, you didn't provide us any proof that it was actually him and that he was actually there, and that wasn't sufficient. So that's really what we're up against here. And also, don't spell it Ainsley. Don't put your I, extra I in Ansley. That's just my little uh, <laughs> tip. Um, finally, um, oh, well, oh, I'll pause here because we have five minutes to go, and I went really quickly through that because um, I wanted to make sure we got through it. Does anybody have any questions about, in light of Justice P, in light of the information I've given you, what it's going to take for a successful Ansley motion or what you might need to do or any practice tips that you, you know, I think the microphone, either I'm doing a really good job up here or the microphone's scaring everybody from questions. Um, um, so this last little bit that I put in here for you is what about new, admissible, and credible evidence? So we kind of, I kind of um, hinted at this a little bit earlier. Um, in Brandon C is uh, one of the seminal cases on this. It was sex abuse counts in the petition. Sister, uh, well aunt I guess in the case, said that they saw it. Um, counts were sustained against father, he contends no, wait, I have new evidence. I've recorded my sister now saying that uh, it was untrue, um, or I have recorded statements um, that she says it's now untrue, and I have some statements signed by her saying the same thing. He files um, a writ asking for relief because his 388 was denied. He had filed a 388 on his basis. Um, or, well, he had filed to vacate the proceedings. The court remanded to give him the opportunity to file a 388 on this basis um, and said that Section 388 is, in fact, the appropriate vehicle for raising issues by an alleged recantation. Now, don't go jumping up and down about this and thinking, oh my gosh, D cases, yes, I, I've had plenty where the kid later says, no, wait, it didn't happen. These need to be really um, significant and substantial and credible recantations. In this case, you had an eyewitness who was not the child who, you know, it's kids, there's all sorts of reasons why they might recant. Um, this case, you had an adult who said, I witnessed it, and that was really what carried the day and got this dad um, a, a decount sustained against him because the kid wasn't saying it. The sister was saying it happened. So it was a little bit different. You have a recantation, not from the victim necessarily, but a victim from an eyewitness, I mean a recantation from an eyewitness that was critical in making the determination at jurisdiction. So don't think that this is going to work in every single case that you have, but just be aware that it's a remedy, potentially. If, if it comes to light, the evidence that the court relied upon in making the finding was not true and you have really good uh, evidence to show that, you might have a 388. Um, and really what this is, is basically it's kind of similar to a 390 dismissal. You're putting forth the 388, saying I want to present this evidence, and now based on this, there's no reason for the court to have jurisdiction. Vacate those prior findings. Kick this case. Um, that's really it. There must be case-by-case fact-specific analysis, and any questions about that? No? Like really covered. All. Yeah, you have a question. Well, you, can, you can just talk about this. No, I don't care. Really. <laughs> I, it wasn't about the last thing you talked about, but going back to using a 388 as a shield. Uh huh. Um, and he said that you know it could be to re to request a change in placement. So if I have a parent who is very concerned about the group home that her child is placed in. Um, for several reasons, including him being bullied and getting injured there, and it being so far away, and them not providing monitors for her. Um, would I use the 388 for a situation like that, where she's like, there are group homes closer to my home that are that have better reputations. My child's failing now. He's talking different. He has a broken tooth. His bed has been destroyed. So I think you can use a 388 in that circumstance. I think what I've heard you saying is that change in circumstances mostly relates to the child. But if you recall, I said you can have change in circumstances that relate to the child. 
I think you're going to have trouble maybe, unless that stuff is in the report, these might be conclusory statements from your client. You might have a hard time proving that change in circumstances, but you can definitely try and craft the best interest argument based on, I mean, if they're in FR and they're entitled to visits and it's not happening because of this, you can definitely craft your best interest argument based on that and rely on the change of circumstances being as um, related to the child's own issues and, and behavior and mental status. Any other questions? Okay, that's it. <laughs>